Welcome back to the Comic Book ASM Artist. Today we're going to do a flip through and just kind of a brief overview of uh, one of my favorite old uh, historical Marvel books. The full title is Five Fabulous Decades of the World's Greatest Comics, Marvel. And it's by Les Daniels. I believe if you go on Amazon and just put in like Les Daniels Marvel, it will uh, probably come up. Uh, this book is available in paperback, which is what I have, as well as a uh, hardcover. And uh, it's one that I had. Uh, this came out in like 1991. And it's one that I always checked out from my local library. And then uh, eventually my mom found it at a local thrift store and purchased it for me. So had it for a while. And it's it's really a time capsule above anything else. And it, it gives a pretty solid overview to um, the early days of Marvel, and for me it just evokes a lot of um, nostalgia and emotion. See, it goes through each of the time periods all the way up through 1990, and then it even includes some reprints of some of the great uh, classic Marvel stories, and then there are superhero profiles, which you'll see as well. And most people remember this from the trading card line, where Stan Lee's portrait is mixed in with all these heroes that he's worked on. And that's an early Stan there, without his mustache that we all have known him for now, and his glasses. I always love this picture too, the stare down of him and Spidey. And I believe if I remember, he actually has a silk, uh, I don't know if it's a picture or a painting, of this hanging in his house somewhere. I remember from the old, um, the newspaper Spider-Man series when they originally collected that in the early 90s. They, they had uh, that same image in there and they had a little excerpt about it. So this is the spinner rack that we all have come to know and love. But uh, they, I know there are probably quite a few of you who, um, I may have heard it referenced, but not ever seen one. So, you know, in the early days, when we would go into pretty much anywhere, whether it was a gas station or a grocery store, bookshop, whatever, bookstore, we would see these, and it would just be filled with comics all the time, and you would just spin the rack, you know, which is how it got the spinner rack name, and you would just find, you know, pretty much any and every a comic book at the time and it would change out all the time every week there would be new books in it you know new monthly books and it was always just a good time to explore and see what they had I'm trying to adapt here this is a, a larger book too I, I would say this is a coffee table book uh, the dimensions are I don't know maybe I don't even know, <laughs> somewhere around like the 12 inch by 12 inch or however you would phrase it. It's not quite, it's not quite 11 by 17, but it's, it's like the square version of that. So here we see a lot of the early, early days of, of Marvel here. <laughs> and see they even acknowledge how Batman and Superman really kind of kick-started things. And that's so weird to think about that those characters were so influential. Another thing I always loved, all of the, um, each decade is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Punctuated by like a, just a, 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 I don't know if this is like, sim I guess it's simplistic, but it's just kind of a bold, image for each period here and it's really cool they have one for each of them this is the golden age here this is the marvel comics number one that most people have known about but never seen in person you know and then here is a reprint of the submariner's first appearance and then here's uh, one of those profile cards I was talking about. And they do this for most of the um, popular heroes at the time. For Human Torch. 
and it's covering all of these guys because they were really the focal point of the early Marvel days. They were known as the Invaders. A couple of other, other big hitters here were the Angel and the Vision. Although they just kind of faded into obscurity. There was, um, and I believe they talk about it in um, the Marvel's Project book that I have. I can't remember. I'll have to look through it. It's been a while. And I believe this is Hangman here. I could be wrong. It says... Is this Blue Diamond? No, it says the Thunder. Here we go. I didn't see that there. The Thunder, the Finn, Blue Diamond, Captain Daring, and the Challenger. But I think I remember him and these two guys being alongside of, you know, Human Torch and Namor and Captain America and the Marvel's Project book. But I'll have to look th back through it. I can't recall if that's who it centralized on or not. And there's a iconic cap. And the thing with this, this book was actually published before America had officially um, announced that they would go to war against Germany. So this was kind of iconic in its own right because it kind of had um, had a, um, a view that wasn't officially where America stood, but where they felt that America's heart was at, was standing up for others. So I thought that was really cool. And I believe, I'm trying to read on the bottom as well. I think Kirby actually did get some flack for that and some threats as well. Kirby um, did his share of things that were uh, controversial among the um, <laughs> publication business. And he, he got a share of threats from local gang members and stuff. And he would usually just all, um, you know, threaten him right back, you know. So he was a really tough guy. And then this here is really the reason why the early comics are so hard to find. They would instruct the kids to take these comics that they had just bought and to go bundle them up and help the troops. So a lot of these kids would be inspired by these comics to go help the troops to help the war effort. And they would just bundle up all their comic books and they'd pulp them down and reuse them for, the, um, for their war effort. And then over here we have, this is uh, Stan Lee's first official written work for Marvel Comics here. Or it's timely at the time, but this is his first official uh, comic book work here. I don't know if you can see it very well, but just a little two-page short story they had. And I really want to get this. This was the original Sentinels of Liberty badge for the uh, Captain America fan club. Other oh, great iconic cap and and then around in the nineties period you always find like these type of images would be on uh, other random Marvel property um, like just you know like your cheapo toys like I remember I had like a four dollar Captain America spy kit that had like binoculars and handcuffs and stuff and you would just see that type of image on the um on the silver background like the action figures had and um, they would have you know those type of images of the heroes you know unique to whatever hero was the focal point of the um, of the toy you bought and then this is showing the shift to from away from superheroes to like their other properties they had a lot of like modeling and romance books because what had happened is whenever the war effort had ceased them um, they switched you know then we could no longer have heroes fighting the germans because the war was over you know like it was done so they switched gears to what else they figured would sell which was westerns and romance at the time and then it really wasn't until until uh, Stan got back on it with Jack Kirby and we're turning out what we would consider as the Marvel masterpiece time, you know. 
So this talks about the crisis here. Marvel tries every kind of comic book imaginable, from humor to horror, and for a while, sales are strong, but boom turns to bust as the medium comes under fire for presenting images of crime and violence. Congressional hearings investigate the link between comics and juvenile delinquency. The future looks dark. And, uh, yeah, this was the period where comics were looked at as, you know, they rot your brains, they're too violent, they're fuel for murderers and all this type of stuff, and there's subliminal sexual messages and all this. I love this. This is the commie smasher cap error here. See that commie smasher? And the comics actually spun it as that period was not Steve Rogers, but another individual art altogether who was inspired by Steve. It was their answer to him being frozen in ice in that time period by having someone else take up the mail who wasn't Steve Rogers. And I'm trying to remember the name of the man who did, but it's not coming to me right now. Yeah, and then you would just see more diverse things. They would make comic books about random musicians at the time. Some Bible books there. Comedy books. They were really trying hard, but it was just... It was too difficult for them. A lot of monster books. That's where your Fin Fang Foom came from. Right there. And this is the Marvel Age. Marvel ushers in a comic book renaissance by humanizing superheroes. Creators introduce a new generation of troubled characters ambivalent about their powers, including Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, the Incredible Hulk. Readers respond and sales soar. So, yeah, that was really the, uh, the secret sauce was um, the heroes having personalities, you know. Not only were they... Um, heroes who were still inspiring but they did have their share of flaws you know spider-man was a kid with money issues who who wanted to help his aunt out um we had the fantastic four who um you know they went up in space and they were um molecularly i can't even say it but they their, their bodies were changed in a way that uh, wasn't voluntary you know and the thing was tortured by the fact that he was, you know, this big rock creature that was, you know, no no semblance of human left when you looked at him, you know. And so there were all these elements. See, there's their profile card. All these elements that um, made them intriguing. They made you want to invest in those books. It wasn't just about um, the powers and the abilities, but it was about the people in the costumes, you know. Another Hulk there. Thor. Spider-Man is the original cover. It mentions the black suit there. And this was right after he had gotten the suit pretty closely, so I don't believe... I could be wrong. There might be a mention of Venom in here. I can't recall, though. And there's the uh, old Marvel fan club kit, the Mary Marvel Marching Society. They had a little record that came with it that had um, a lot of the writers and artists of the time had done a quick little couple second voiceover on it to say hey to the readers. And that was really, um, Stan gets a lot of credit for that with a lot of the thinking outside of the box ideas, you know, with, with um, giving them the silly titles before their name, you know. Jazzy John Ramita, Smile and Stan, you know, just different stuff like that as opposed to just presenting their names. He would do so with alliteration, with a silly adjective typically before it. And here was back in the day, they got no prize envelopes. This was whenever you spotted an error in a Marvel comic. 
and wrote in to them about it, they would reward you with an empty envelope to say, hey, here's your no prize for spawning, you know, we miscolored Captain America in this issue, or, you know, whatever it was, so. But they don't do that anymore, unfortunately. Quite the opposite there. Usually defensive these days, it seems, but hopefully it'll pass. Here's some old um, merch here. I always love seeing these shots of this old stuff, you know. And at that time, there might have been a people who had a lot of this stuff, but now it's very hard to find most of the things pictured in this um, in this book. Very few items. Silver Surfer here, and Stan says that uh, when he wrote Silver Surfer, a lot of the monologues that the surfer would give would be a lot of the um the own the stuff that he was personally thinking about pertaining to humanity and society or what have you. So I thought that was interesting because Silver Surfer definitely has a very um a very uh, philosophical and deep side to him so it's it's fun to um to see stan in that light you know he wasn't just a guy with a megaphone making a lot of noise about these heroes he would write for but he was uh he was someone with a with a deeper personality beneath the surface ultron here I always just love this book, you know, I would spend hours just reading every little bit of it, and I highly recommend this. I have other Marvel books from uh, whenever, you know, they talk about through the decades, but I would say that this was easily uh, my most enjoyable one, just the presentation of everything, and I don't know if it's because I'm linked that, to that 90s period so much, you know, those those images, they they bring back nostalgia to me, but... I do find them, they're just bright and enjoyable, you know. The research and development. Now the industry leader, Marvel, unleashes a young generation of creators, and the result is a period of wild artistic exploration. Innovative characters range from a savage barbarian to an international brotherhood of mutants. But the expansion creates some growing pains. And I mean, I guess this is a period that I don't really know a lot about in the Marvel age. I wasn't really too into any of, like, the Barbarian books or anything like that. I was I was just into the uh, superhero books, so I really missed the boat on a lot of the uh, experimental type things or the um, Kung Fu books at the time. Yeah, I remember this here. This was... um. In this Spider-Man book here, they were not able to put uh, the Comics Code Authority uh, seal on this book because it did have drugs drawn within it, and that was one of the things in the code is you couldn't uh, show drug use, whether positive or negative. You had to um, just leave it out altogether. So this was a book where Marvel stood their grand ground, and they said, okay, we won't have the seal on it, but um, we're not going to not put it out because... It dealt with drugs in a negative light. It wasn't glorifying them. It was showing the tragedy behind them. And yeah, I never really got into stuff like the Man Thing or Dracula or any of the monster books. But this period was really where where that stuff started to show up. The Ghost Rider here. Blue Cage there. Pencils there. It's beautiful looking stuff though, and a lot of it back in the day, well, not even that long ago, maybe they stopped it about maybe 15 years ago, where they would reprint um, large chunks of the early Marvel comics into these giant black and white, non colored uh, phone books, is what I would call them. 
and uh, it would be great. You would see all of the line work without uh, the coloring, because sometimes um, the color would detract from the mastery of the of the pencil and ink work. So I enjoyed seeing those because you would see them um, how those artists had intended it before they put it through the coloring, which sometimes wasn't um, what it could be. And that wasn't really the fault of anyone. It was really just an assembly line process. You know, they had to get stuff out as fast as they could. There's a nice uh, Punisher there. I think that's actually a Jim Lee drawing of Punisher. I know he did work on the book for a little bit. But uh, that was one of those I was able to read. My mom was very protective of me, so... I couldn't read most of the books back in the day. And this was the start of where a lot of people picked up the X-Men. It's where they showed Wolverine and Colossus. And most of these guys here were um, brand new. These are all your new guys right here. And there's your classic crew behind them. And that would be where a lot of people would really consider the, um, the start of the golden age for the um, X-Men universe. There we go. Just really cool. And Howard the Duck here. And this is what I was talking about, the early uh, newspaper strips for Spider-Man. They ran several years. I can't even remember for how long. Uh, I don't know if it says it here or not. But it ran forever, like decades, if I remember correctly. And I remember even my local paper in the 90s, they were still putting out brand new strips for it. And I believe it started in the 70s. You know, the Marvel Universe. Editor Marvel consolidates its gains, introduces a new editorial system, and finds different publishing formats and marketing strategies to reach the contemporary breed of a committed comic book collectors. Sensational success continues as Marvel attracts the artists and writers who can keep its heroes endlessly appealing. And this is whenever I reference the CBS Spider-Man. That's what that is. This is the early, early live action days here. And that's the uh, Spider-Man cartoon. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. The She-Hulk and Spider-Woman. And it's their adult line epic. And I never got exposed to this. I'm not sure if it was the same vein as Heavy Metal was or not. I mean, the covers make it seem that way, but I am unaware of uh, the interiors of the book. But I would imagine if it wasn't, it was probably pretty close. Maybe just as violent, but not as much nudity. I'm not sure. Some more character cards there, Wolverine. And I like both of those suits, truthfully. It's um, I know the cartoon one holds a good significance for me, but I really like this color scheme on them as well. Something just really dynamic about it. And I know it seems like now they're really trying to make things look futuristic and slick, you know, so... I think they're overcomplicating when they're doing their suit redesigns. So yeah, during this time period too, you would see a lot of just random, um, uh, I don't know if these are intellectual properties, but you'd see a lot of uh, just random things would become Marvel comic series of Barbie and Fraggle Rock and stuff like this. and. I remember they had some of the Nickelodeon characters. Ren and Stimpy uh, were through Marvel. Rocco's Modern Life was a Marvel book. Uh, Beavis and Butthead had a Marvel book. Bill and Ted had a Marvel book. So you would just find uh, Captain Planet was through Marvel. 
you would find these properties just suddenly pop up and be like, oh man, there's a book for this. And I believe as this, well, this is getting close to the section where they reprint uh, full stories here, I think. I'm talking about Jim Lee's War Journal Punisher. And I remember when they had the premiere of the Spider-Man balloon at the Thanksgiving Day Parade. I mean, I was little, little. Let's see here. Was Did it say it was 1987? When it had um, first shown up, I believe that's what it's saying here. But I know there's no way I could have remembered that when I was two, but... I definitely remember seeing this balloon on the TV and having it be a huge deal. Back in the earlier days of the parades, they didn't have a lot of the um, properties like that, and they didn't come until later. Here's some more just fun random merchandise here. I guess that a lot of it at this time would Whenever the book was printed, you could find most of it on your shelf. But uh, not so much anymore. The She-Hulk. You're showing some of their uh, early Marvel movies here. And uh, this Captain America was actually their response to the 1989 Batman movie. And it uh, tested so poorly in theaters that they put it straight to video. And uh, another great detail here, the suit fit him so tight that the ears on the suit were actually rubber fake ears over the top of his real ears because they couldn't get his ears through the suit. So, a little random. And then like the climax of the movie, him and the president are like fist fighting all these goons at like a nuclear missile launch. And the president is like this elderly guy, and he's fighting like just as well as Captain America. So I thought that was pretty <laughs> over the top. Yeah, so, yeah, it's got Dimension of Venom in there then. Because as I was talking, it's like, well, I think they put the Spider-Man 1 in there, and that was definitely after Todd had already established and I don't know if you guys have read this. This is the, it's called Spider-Man Torment is the name of that storyline. And it's, it's pretty interesting. It has its faults, but visually it's, um, it's pretty cool to look at. And then, yeah, here's Mobius's Silver Surfer work here. There's some CG work up here. by Mike Sainz. I'm not sure if that's the same guy who did, there was a Batman 2000, I want to say, where they did another where it was all computerized, too. And this shows the process of the Marvel method. You get a summarized script. You pencil your pages. They get lettered. And this was all by hand back then. And then they would ink it. And then they would paint it. And that was your thing. And then they would submit it and uh, okay it and put it in the book. And go through. This was their bullpen where all the artists and writers would work together. They'd print it printed page and the comic shop yeah and then this section here this showcases some of the earlier works and the nice thing too since the pages are so big you get to see them in a format that at this time was really um really uh like pristine you wouldn't see these pages in this form. Now they have like the artist editions and stuff where they're able to pull this sort of thing off. But at that time it wasn't the norm. I 
remember there's uh, one part in particular in this book. It was an exclusive that you could only get at, um, I think it was Sears. So they reprinted it in here, which was the only place you could get it if you didn't find it there. And I recently almost had the opportunity to buy this um, issue of the Fantastic Four about six months ago. I wish I had. It's considered, this is one of uh, Stanley's favorite stories he wrote about uh, the thing internalizing the struggles of being the man or the monster he had become. And I don't know, and Stan may have actually been going through stuff emotionally that might not be public knowledge. I mean, if, if you write about, you know, tortured, troubled heroes and things like that, you have to draw a little bit of that from experience. Here's some of uh, Kirby's cosmic um, collage stuff here. I want to say if I remember he printed these out, they were photos, and then he, he colored over them or something, I can't recall. But it definitely was something that you didn't see in comics. Yeah, this right here, this Wolverine story. It's created, sold exclusively through Sears stores around the U.S., Limited and intended as a quick course to instruct the general public in the care and feeding of Marvel's most popular mutant. Refers to it as Wolverine 101. And it's pretty cool. It's like a Wolverine in Japan story here, which was really Claremont's claim to fame. You got some blood there. You don't even see that in your normal Marvel books, really. But I guess they were robots, so that made it okay. And there's our little our little Todd McFarlane Spidey. And there's the index. But, yeah, I highly recommend this book. Go find it if you can. Les Daniels Marvel. Type that in. And uh, you should be able to find it. I'm not sure what it's going for. Like I said, I had I got this book a long, long time ago. But uh, I have seen very few Marvel uh, history books that have matched it since. And uh, Les Daniels did work on a DC one as well that I own. But uh, I do like this one better. So go find it. I can't rec recommend it enough. But uh, that's going to do it for now. Uh, you all have a good day or night. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and grow the channel. Alright, thanks so much. Bye.